Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and this is an exquisite example of a Robert Woods American long rifle. This classic Pennsylvania rifle is pictured on page 174 of the Kentucky Rifle by John G.W. Dillon and is listed as from the author's collection. This rifle has many of the same attributes to those by famed Pennsylvania rifle maker Nicholas Hawk of Northampton County, Pennsylvania, so much so that many would identify it readily as a Hawk rifle if it was not otherwise signed. Many of the details on the Hawk rifle in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection, for example, are very similar to this rifle. Some have questioned whether or not this rifle is actually a Hawk rifle inscribed for Woods, but the AS inscription on the silver wrist extension suggests the original owner's initials were AS. Also, like Hawk, Robert Wood made parts purchases from Bolton Gunworks in the early 1830s, and Robert Woods is listed in secondary sources as from Pocono, Northampton County, Pennsylvania, in the early 19th century. The lock is marked J. Edmonds Warranted and has some floral and border engraving. It is equipped with a plain trigger. I'd like to note here, too, that this rifle has been professionally reconverted back to flintlock. So this is a pretty neat example of a Pennsylvania long rifle here. It's got kind of a storied history here because of its resemblance to a hawk made American long rifle. The really big distinction that we're citing here is this not being a hawk rifle is this nameplate engraved on the barrel. Typically where the maker or the builder would sign their rifle. We have a brass inlaid plate here with the name Robert Woods. At the front and rear of the name, we have some nice grass-like finials. We have a simple dot border kind of running along the brass plate. And in here we have two kind of wing motifs surrounding a circle and a star, all within the same plate. Like many Pennsylvania rifles of its day, we have brass hardware with the exception of the barrel and the lock. We have a simple narrow brass butt plate here, a common two band structure here, on the butt plate, the narrow band coming first and a wider band second. They're kind of the remnants of facets on the top of this butt plate here, but they've since been worn. Uh, we have one single screw on the top of this butt plate. At the rear of our brass butt plate towards the bottom, we have a single screw holding this together. We also have our patch box release back here at the back of the butt plate. We pull that patch box release up our patch box is opened and we can see inside here a rectangular, fairly unfinished patch box interior. The patch box is flanked on the top and bottom by some beautifully cut patch box faces here. We even have kind of a folksy, what would now in the contemporary space be called kind of a weeping heart pattern window cut into each of these plates here, revealing some of the curly maple stock underneath. The brass on this patch box is very similar to those that we see in other Pennsylvania long rifles from this period. It's very thin brass with very fine engraving. Um, we have to think about these being done without the super magnification that we have today, and it's just beautiful. But they aren't very deep cuts. In some original examples, it's hard to even see the engraving because we're not seeing engraving cuts that are going in, you know, a 32nd or a 16th of an inch perhaps into that metal. Top and bottom of our patch box here are very similar, nearly identical, kind of mirror images of each other with some simple scroll work and some shading lines and borders surrounding each section. The patch box isn't held on with screws or bolts. We have some simple nails or tacks holding this together. As we come forward of our rectangular patch box here, we have a beautiful curved semicircle here, and another window cut into our patch box to reveal some of that curly maple stock. Patch box comes up to a floral or sunburst pattern on its centermost tack here at the front. This panel is cut away again in kind of the traditional scroll patterns as we come up to a sharp point lining up with the rest of our rifle as we come forward. Beautiful patch box. I really like uh, the windows that are cut in here, it gives you 
the feeling that this patch box is much lighter than it actually is. It gives it some color contrast with the rest of the stock. It's just really well executed. When we think about the shapes of this butt stock, both the kind of swoop of the Pennsylvania long rifle as it comes back here atop the crest of the stock, and we factor in this curve down here to the sharp point of our toe, I think it's easy to see where stylistically Robert Woods would have chosen to go with kind of this sharp front to the patch box, as well as these points coming off the tail of our patch box, and then these points in these hearts on either side. Replicating these sharp shapes that we have with the wood stock as well as the patch box, our toe plate terminates in a nice point as well. Again, with some simple nick and line border engraving, some simple shading, and then another series of border lines with a wedding band at the tail. The toe plate is also held in with three small tacks. Aligning with the toe, it's faded now, but we do have some incised line carving coming up from our toe up to the trigger guard here. It could almost really be mistaken for grain in the wood, uh, but as we feel it with our fingers here, till it's just the, I remember, just the softest line that we can see there. Factor in the raised edges of our patch box and perhaps that thin, uh, really shallow carving for that incised line could have been lost with age as the wood kind of shrinks with time. A simple, very typical brass trigger guard here with our single trigger. The trigger guard itself has some file work. We have some facets here at the tail of our trigger guard uh, right in line with where our trigger guard pin is. And then we have your really typical four you know, the golden age of the long rifles trigger guard here. We have facets in the main bow and then some facets here as well as this begins to terminate towards the front with some other filed lines going perpendicular to those facets. Now coming up here to our lock, this is an appropriate lock for this rifle. Again, this rifle has been reconverted back to a flintlock at some point in its life, but looking at it, it's a very well done example of that. The lock is stamped with J. Edmund Warranted, uh, documented to be used by rifle makers in this area of Pennsylvania in the era that this rifle would have been used. The lock features some nice simple engraving on the lock plate as well as the cock. It's a pretty slim lock, I would say. This isn't our big bulky locks and it's not our small, really petite Ketland style locks. The tail of the lock plate features some perpendicular file work going up and down, and then some border engraving as well. Our lock mortise is soft. It has been carried, it has been used. It's not necessarily crisp, but this rifle is in no way new. So that makes a lot of sense, and I'm happy to see that in a rifle like this. I like seeing, you know, again, the rifle's carried and used and worn. On top of our wrist here, we have a beautiful silver extension with some simple engraving uh, borders here. It's held on with two brass nails with the initials AS. The tang of this barrel begins as a rectangle, has a single tang bolt going through the tang into the trigger plate before stepping down to a nice point. Again, a balance of these shapes can be seen across this rifle. As we look through the whole piece, we can see it's a composition and there are artistic choices being made here. The barrel is fully octagonal. Looking at it here, I believe it to be swamped. It's a 42 and three quarters inch long barrel and the barrel is 45 caliber, but the barrel has been lined at some point in its life. As we come forward here between our lock and our rear sight, we have our signature plate. We have a very petite rear sight on this rifle, both in length and width. It's about half an inch long this rear sight and even shorter as we look at it down the barrel. The front sight is a simple brass blade front sight. Again, very, very low on this rifle in much contrast to what we see in many rifles or many contemporary rifles made today. In sighting down this rifle, it's not an obstruction. It's not difficult, at least for my eyes here, to line up that front sight as short as it may be on the barrel. Contemporary researchers and historians and makers of long rifles you know, all tend to agree this shallow or short front sight was because of the daily use that these rifles went through. The shooters or the marksman's eyes were trained to find that short sight. That short sight wouldn't catch on clothing, on brush, or on trees as you move through the woods. 
as we move around this rifle, I want to make note of this wear plate along the bottom on the base, really, of our ramrod channel. This isn't very common in many original flintlock rifles. You begin to see it being added as a decorative element in the later years of the American long rifle and as we get into the percussion long rifle era. Whether this is decorative or used to patch a you know, <laughs> kind of a wayward ramrod uh, drill, we can't say, at least looking at it here, uh, but it is beautifully added to this rifle. Uh, its shape is very pleasing. It's very even on either side. It's held on with small tacks on either side, and the engraving on this plate matches the patch box, the toe plate, the other engraved elements, which makes me think this was added by the maker, by Robert Woods, as he was building this rifle. This wear plate connects the front of our trigger guard to the rear of our entry pipe here. Our entry pipe is worn, and I imagine when carried, like many of these rifles, this entry pipe lines up very well with a balance point of this rifle. So as if I were carrying this through the woods or on the farm, my hand is going to line up on that entry pipe. And I think, I believe at least, that that could be the cause for the wear on this entry pipe. The pipe features several filed elements. At the front we have a band and a series of facets, although they are worn, before we get back into a two more filed elements, the main body of our entry pipe, and another wedding band motif filed in there. This motif matches very well with our two ramrod pipes as we come up the stock. Both feature narrow wedding bands and facets going around the ramrod. Like many ramrod pipes for the time, these are held in with simple pins. Along this side of the rifle, we have these silver plates, these silver extensions added to the stock. These are opposite of barrel keys as we're going to look at on the other side. Each of these plates has a beautiful kind of zigzag pattern engraving. Again, very shallow engraving going around each of these plates, but the line is so fine and so crisp, it holds up very well. You'll notice here at the muzzle, we have a brass nose cap, and our first ramrod pipe is set back from the muzzle here a few inches, just past our first uh, barrel key extension here towards the muzzle. Looking at the side plate side here, you can see the four barrel keys as they set in matching silver plates opposite the lock plate side. On either side, I've been able to verify it now, we do have a nice molding line running just above these barrel keys from our entry pipe to the muzzle. Our side plate is a beautifully inlaid brass side plate with two lock bolts, very bulbous lock bolts, but very appropriate for the area and the period. There's no engraving on our side plate, no real artistic expression here like we might see from other makers. As we come back to our butt stock here, you'll notice we don't have a whole lot more artistic expression. This is a very subdued, a very calm rifle, I would say artistically, where we have evidence with this engraving, especially with our patch box, of skill and execution, but it's not over. It's not overdone. It's not exuberant. It's not lambasting you with the ability of the maker. You can quietly see the ability of Robert Woods with that engraving. Even these, even these barrel key extension plates here, they're very simple, but when you look really close at these lines, it's a simple engraving pattern, but it's very well done. Very single lines as we go across here, this zigzag, and you can see where he's connected it in just this one little spot uh, where he's overlaid those lines. It's that kind of execution that, although we have kind of a blank canvas back here, it's left to be blank and it's left to just be. Something that's neat here is we have another silver accession plate here accompanying our wrist accession, but this one is largely blank. We have our, again, zigzag engraving border here with a few cut lines, and then we have a beautiful shape cut into this plate, but it's left empty. Um, seems like the kind of plate that you would see uh, an attribution made or, or maybe a designation made of the owner of the rifle, some more information about either the maker or the owner of the rifle, but that has not been added, at least at the time of, of manufacture, at the time of my, my telling you in this video. Our cheek rest is, again, very worn, very soft. We have a couple molding lines cut into this cheek piece, uh, and they still 
are fairly deep. They're noticeable, much more noticeable than the molding lines on the stock moving forward here. Um, but they are worn. Both the front and the back are very, very worn. And as you run your finger across it here, not a whole lot of depth change across that cheek piece. And the cheek piece isn't very pronounced away from the stock. Uh, we have this plate on the top, and then underneath it, we have a vent pick, a holder of some kind here of rolled brass. And again, much like our cheek piece being worn, the brass face on this vent pick holder here. This pick holder is also worn. You can see two wedding bands here. Probably the means of attachment uh, would be some wire or, or thin sheet wrapped around a rolled tube of this brass and then set into the stock like nails, tying that vent pick holder into the stock. It's all very worn, not very pronounced at all, not a lot of definition. That's not to the uh, discredit of the maker, again, most likely because of wear of this rifle being brought up to the cheek over and over and over again being used. Overall, I see this as a beautiful example of an American long rifle. It's purpose driven, it's made to shoot, it's made to hunt, but there are still artful qualities about it. And that's something that I love, I just love, love, love about the American long rifle. There are hundreds of years of muzzle loaders. But this right here, this is an American long rifle to me. It's a Pennsylvania long rifle. We know the county that this was made in. We know who made it. We know who they were getting their parts from. And that's just cool. You know, everything about this is Americana to me. And uh, from just the beautiful, artful patch box, the, you know, the, again, the heavy barrel, the long barrel here, the flintlock ignition, it's just neat. A rifle like this is just, that's just it. You know, that's, that's all you need. You know, when you look at, when you look at firearms history, I think you have to really work to not pause at the period of the American long rifle, the period in which Robert Woods was working to admire both the ingenuity, the industrial nature of, to be able to build one of these, and then the artistic touch to give it, you know, to pass it from a functional tool to a work of art. It's just something I think you have to respect and, and I enjoy every single time I get to look at one of these, just classic American long rifles. I just, I fall in love with them over and over again. I'd like to thank the Rock On Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to share this rifle with you here today. This is really kind of a special time for many of these rifles before they go back into private collection. Um, I'm super interested and now the, the similar rifle that we can see in the Met. Um, perhaps I need to make a trip to, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and seek out the rifle that is similar to this one because it's just beautiful. You know, it's just a work of American art, pure American art to me. Um, so if you'd like to see more pictures or videos of beautiful muzzleloaders like this one, I encourage you to visit the Rock On Auction Company social media pages, We're posting a ton of great high quality photos and videos, educational content for you to learn more about firearms history. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.